So here, I just want to explain a little bit more about what we mean by this term quantum units. So if I look at my Yablonsky diagrams and I look at the processes that can occur, all of these individual processes have a certain probability of occurring. So if I ignore my absorption, my absorption is only doing one thing for me essentially, it is generating an excited state. All of the other processes happen from the excited state. And so what my quantum yield is, is a measure of how many um, of the excited states decay by each method or the proportion of excited states that decay by each method. So I can have fluorescence and internal conversion from my singlet state, and I can also have intersystem crossing from my singlet to my triplet. They are the only things that happen to my singlet excited state. Nothing else happens. They are the only three possible fates at this point of my singlet excited state. From my triplet state, well, the amount of phosphorescence depends on how much triplet I make. So I can then look at my triplet state decaying by either phosphorescence or vibrational relaxation. And the proportion of those that occur is going to depend not only on the fate of the triplet state, but on how much triplet state I can make. So my quantum yield formally is the number of excited states lost to a given pathway divided by the number of photons absorbed, in other words, the number of excited states that I make. And I can look at quantum yields for any particular process. Here I've written down the equations. This very top one on the left-hand side is the quantum yield equation for my fluorescence. Here you can see I've taken the rate constant for um, loss of the excited state by fluorescence. And then I've, I've got the sum of all of the rate constants for the different pathways. Consequently, if Kf is very, very large compared to the other rate constants, Kst and Kic, I'm going to expect a very large quantum yield, something approaching one. Whereas if Kf is very small, I'm going to expect a quantum yield which is equally very small. A lot of the things we consider to be fluorescent have um, quantum yields which are very, um, very large, approaching one in some cases. But there are quite a things that quite a lot of things that we think of that fluoresce where their quantum yields is much lower. But more importantly, the quantum yield can depend upon the state of the system. And that's what I'm showing here. So here, this is the same molecule. This is this Yopro one, which I've used elsewhere. And we can see that when I look at the um, emission, when it's bound to DNA, and the emission when it's not bound to DNA, they're very, very different. And the reason for this is that by binding this, this molecule to DNA, I'm changing the opportunity um, of the molecule losing energy by internal conversion. If I look at this molecule here, um, I have this oxazole group um, and I've got this methane bridge between these two ring systems. There's a double bond and there's a single bond and rotation can occur around this bond. So when the dye is in free solution, we have rotation, I have an efficient method of internal conversion and the rate constant for internal conversion is very high. When this is bound to DNA, I stop rotation around this bond, and so the rate constant for internal conversion drops considerably. The equations I've used on this, um, this slide, though, aren't the quantum yield equations, they're the lifetime equations, which are quite closely related. <coughs> and the top one is from my lifetime of my fluorescence, and I can see it's linked to the... Um, the rate constant for, um, for emission, for fluorescence, the rate constant for the singlet's triplet conversion, and the rate constant of the internal conversion. And so if I change the size of each of the contributions, I'm going to change this fluorescence lifetime. The one underneath is just the same thing for phosphorescence. Hope this has helped, um, and I'll be back with more.